Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the T's. We have been solving math problems out of this book here, the ATIT study manual, the sixth edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Today is our last lesson in the series, the very last lesson. You won't see me again. Uh, and uh, today being the day 180. We are working as I showed you before in a second ago on the 6th edition. If you are interested in solving the problems that also appeared in the previous edition, the 5th edition, as I always reminded you, you will find the solutions to all the problems from the 5th edition from day number 1 through 80. 1 through 80. Right here. T is 5. T is 5. The, the solutions were from day 1 through 80 and T6 that we are going to finish today T6 that we are working on that we are going to finish today goes from day 101 through day 180 don't try to look for videos from day 81 through 100 they do not exist we started a new series with day 101 to 180 and today we'll do the last three problems in the quiz, in the test. Problem number 29, 30, or rather problem number 30, 31st, and 32nd. Let's take a look at it. Problem number 30. Problem number 30. In the event, in the event that, that after having watched these videos you find that what I have to offer is worthwhile and that you would like some personal help, one-to-one -one tutoring, private tutoring, one-to-one. -one. I teach on Skype. This is what I do all day. Uh, I have clients who are in different parts of the country. Uh, and I teach them on Skype, one-to-one. -one. And if you're interested in, in, in being taught by me, if you're interested in working with me uh, for your preparation for the exam, not only just for the T's, but also in the future for any math course, any statistics course you might take uh, in your program. If you need help, you can always get hold of me. There is my phone number, one 800 1-800-808-PREP-P-R-E-P is my email address, prepsat at aol.com. Prepsat is a, long, is a long story. Many, 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 many moons ago, in 1989, when I first began this line of work, all I was doing was SAT, and of course nobody could see the future. All I was doing was, uh, doing was teaching prep courses for the SAT, and hence my email address, prepsat, and after that I was unable to change the address because it's just, you can't change your address, your phone number, it's just too much hassle. You can get hold of me, prepsat at aol.com, 1-800-808-PREP, and here's my website, kashwaniprep.com. Let's keep going. Enough of the plugging in, enough of the talk. Number 30. It says, what's the percentage, what's the percentage of schools that taught are required health education course in or other what we're going to put down are the percentage of the percentage of schools that total required course of health education in each grade in each grade and here are the here are the thing sixth sixth grade seventh grade eighth grade ninth grade tenth grade 11th grade and 12th grade. I want to look at the book if they actually give you the data or if they give you if it, they show us the bar graph. So I'm taking the bar, bar graph and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, taking the observations from there from the bar graph. For the 6th grade you will see it was 73 percent. For 7th grade it was 73.6 percent. Then we have 74.1 percent. And then we have 74.7 percent. And then 19.8%, it just drops 20.3% and 20.2%. And the question is, what is the average? What is, what is the average for, what is the average for grade 6 through 9? For grades 6 through 9 grade 6 through 9 even though the actual bar graph gives us the reading for 10th grade 11th grade and 12th grade 
we're not interested in 10th, 11th, 12th grade. We just want to know what's the average percentage of the school, what's the average percentage of the school that taught this particular health education course. Well, we don't need 10th, 11th, 12th grade. We're just looking for the average for these four numbers. That's all it is. We're going to erase this part right here. We need the average of these four numbers. That's what. That's all we need. So here's what we're going to do, okay? We could actually sit down and punch in all of these numbers on the calculator and do it out, but we're not going to do that. Watch how we do it. I need the room, so I'm going to erase this part. Let's erase this part also. We all, all, all this question is asking is, what's the average of these four numbers? So listen, what's going on? Here's what we're going to do. Pay attention here. You see 73, 73, 74, 74, 70 appears everywhere. So let's just ignore the 70 for the time being. Let's just ignore the 70 for the time being. Let's just add up the remaining figures. And, and also let's just ignore the decimal for the time being. It will make our calculation quicker. So 30, 36, 41, 47. But we have to understand that 47 is not 47, 47 is 4.7. 41 is not 4.7. 41 is 4.1 and so forth. Let, let's add them up. We get 6 plus 1 is 7, 7 plus 7 is 14, 4, carry 1. And we get uh, 3 plus 3 is uh, 6, 6 plus 4 is 10, and 10, 5 plus 1 is 15. Keep in mind that 15 is not 15, 15 is actually, uh, 154 is not 154, it is actually 15.4 because decimal points exist here. Now what is suppose we're going to get if we divide this figure by 4 because there are 4 of them. 9th grade, 10th grade, 11th, oh sorry, 6th grade, 7th grade, 8th grade, and 9th grade. There are four of them. What do you suppose we're going to get if we divide 15.4 by 4? And again, those who don't waste your time trying to do it out precisely. Just understand that 15.4 is approximately 16, and 16 divided by 4, 16 divided by 4 is 4. So the average of these these numbers right here, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you here. The average of these numbers, average of average of three, three point six, four point one, and four point seven, we just established is approximately four. And then we have a seventy. Then we have seventy in the front. Then we have seventy in the front. Therefore, the average is about. I was gonna say equal to, but not equal to. We're not figure figuring out the exact value. The average is approximately 74% because here is 4% right here approximately the average of these four is approximately 4 and here is the 70 it's about 74 pick an answer choice that comes closest to 74 and if you look at the answer choices answer choices A says answer choices A says 51% it is not it is most definitely not 51% the average of four numbers where every one of them is more than 70 cannot be 50. How can the average of four numbers be 50 if they are all more than 70? It's just nonsense. Similarly, answer choice C says 42%. That's even more insane. Answer has to be either 73 or 74. 73 or 74. But watch what happens. In order for it to be have been 73, in order for the average to, to have been 73, the average of these four numbers, average of these four numbers, 3, 3, 4, and 4.7, in order for the average to be 73, these four numbers should have, should have added up to 12. Again, the average of four numbers where every one of them is more than 3 cannot be 3. It is impossible for the average of four numbers to be 3 if given the fact that every one of them is three or more. If I take four exams, listen carefully, if I take four quizzes, and in every quiz I scored more than 60, in every quiz I score 60 or more, in the first exam I score 64, in the second exam I score 67, in the third exam I score 60, in the fourth exam I score 75, I took four quizzes and I scored 60 or more in all of those four exams, then my overall average cannot possibly be less than 60. Do you understand? Average can never ever be lower than the lowest number in the range and average can never ever be higher than the maximum number in the range. If my highest score in the four quizzes was 72 and all the others were less than 72, then my average is not going to be more than 72. Same thing here. The average is not going to be 73. In order for it to be 73, these have to add up to 12. They do not, obviously, they clearly they do not add up to 12 because there are two, three there are four numbers, all of them are more than three. And we know I add up to 15. I spoke too much. 
Let's go to the next one, shall we? We're making too much fuss about it. Number 31. Number 31, which is the penultimate question, and then the 32. In number 31, in question number 31, they give us a scatter plot. We're going to actually reproduce the scatter plot by using the data that I'm going to put on the blackboard. So I'm going to give you the data, which is not the exact same data as what is given in the book, but it's very close approximation. Do you understand? Very close approximation actually is redundant. There is no such, you know, but you get the idea. It's very close to what the reality is. Here, the, here's the data set. A is 10, 10. B is 15, 9. And your job is to plot it on the graph. C is 5, 7. D, this 5 should add a, line up with this 5 right here. It's going to bother me. 5, 7. E is 15, 5. E is, E was 15, 5. I just, I marked it up, didn't I? D is 2, 5. D is 2, 5. E is 15, 5. Yes, what I said was, I marked it up. Do you understand? Marked it up with the letter M. Not F. F is 34, G is 43, and H is 75, O, and I is 80 and 2. Let's plot them, shall we? So here's the y-axis, and the y-axis we can clearly see, on the y-axis we can clearly see that the, that the reading goes, the lowest we have is 2, and the highest we have is 10, that's, that's how it goes, so, let's, so it, let's go from 2 to 10, all the way to 0 to 10, so here we go, 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10, that's good enough, 10, 8, 6, 4, and 2. You have to be reasonable. You have to be you've got to eyeball it, but you have to be reasonable. You cannot you cannot go around saying you cannot go around saying two, four, six, eight. It's just silly. That's sloppy. Even them out as much as you can. And then on x-axis it goes all the way from ten to eighty. All the way from ten to eighty. So here we go. Let's mark our eighty here. This is our x-axis. Let's mark our eighty there. Halfway there, somewhere here is going to be our forty. Half of that is going to be about 20, and this is 60. And that is good enough. We are ready to plot our points. And after we have them, we are going to see which of the, which of the four statements actually makes sense based on these observations. 10, 10. 10, 10 is going to be, this is 20, so this is 10 right here. 10, 10, all the way. 10, 10, right here. This is our point A. Point B is 15, 9. If this is 10 and this is 20, 15 is here, 15, 9, 9 is here. This is the point B. Point B. C is 5, 7. 5, 7. If this is 10, this is 5, and 7 is going to be way up here. This is the point C. Hit me so far? Point D is 2, 5. As you can see, it doesn't take too long. Too far. This is 5. The 2 is going to be very close to here, 2 and 5. 5 is going to be here somewhere, 2, 5, right here. This is our point D, 15, 5. 15 is right here, 5 was, 5 is going to be somewhere here, 15, 5. Is. Did we have another, another observation 15? Yes, we had another observation with 15, which is why we have line for 15 already. See, this, this thing is point, point E. Point E this thing is point E which is 15 5 15 5 point E 15 5 but the reason we had the vertical line already is because we had another one with the 15 right here 15 and 9 15 and 9 30 and 4 30 this is 20 this is 40 30 is going to be somewhere here 30 and 4 that's point F 40 and 3 40 and 3, 3 is right here. This is G, this is F. 
edge for 75 and 4. 75 is going to be, this is 60, this is 80, this is 70, 75 is here. 75 and 4. 4 is, we just did 4 right here. Continue right here. And that's point H. And I is 80 and 2. 80 is right here and 2 is right there. The question is, when we when we plot a fit, it is called finding a, a good fit, what sort of sh shape is it going to take? What sort of shape is it going to take? So I wish I had a different color here. And in, in, in order to have the fit, we want the distance from the from the shape that we're going to claim to each of the point as little as possible. Our job is to minimize the distance from the actual observation to the estimated observation. The estimated observation is all, all what are going to show up on the, on the shape. I'm going to put them in different colors so you can see them right here. There's the first one, there's the second one right here. This, this is no good. This color is no good. There's the third one right here. Then there's one right here, there's one right there, one right there. You can only see the shape. You can only see the shape. The shape is going to look something like this. Oh, I left. That's the outlier probably. And that looks like a little bit of an outlier. There's an outlier here and these are very close to shape. But that's what we're looking at here. That's the relationship between x, y-axis and the x-axis. And there is an equation for it, which we're not going to worry about it here. It's not required for the t's, but you can actually mathematically calculate the exact equation for it. And once you have the equations, you can plug in the value for one variable and it will predict you, it will give you the prediction for the value of the other variable. You understand? Let's look at answer choice A. Answer choice A says, answer choice A says, as, as, as x goes down, y goes down. Well, if, if that's the case, if x goes down, then y goes down, which is same as saying, which is same as saying that x, x goes up, y goes up, they move in the same direction. But if they move in the same direction, that implies positive slope. Positive, that implies positive slope if they both move in the same direction. Does this, does this graph seem to you like a, like a positively sloped graph? No. It is negatively sloped graph. It is negatively sloped because, watch what happens, as we move from here from 5 to 80, as we increase the value of x, as we increase the value of x, as x goes up, at 5, x value of y is here. At 20, the value of y is here. At 40, the value of y is this. At 60, the value of y is this. At x goes up, y goes down. Or if you like, if you like, if you start from the other end, from 80, as the value of x goes down, the value of y keeps going up. It is not positively slow. It's the other way around. It is negatively slow. Answer choice A is wrong. Answer choice B says, there is no relationship between x and y. I'm not going to write the whole thing. Answer choice B claims that there is no relationship. There bloody well is. We can see it right there. Of course they are related. There's a clear distinct pattern here. They're not, they're not scattered all over, the, all over the graph with no rhythm or rhyme to them. There definitely seems to be a rhythm. There definitely seems to be a rhyme. There bloody well is a pattern. They are related. Which one be strong? Answer choice D says that the relationship is linear. It's a linear relationship. What does linear mean? Linear means, linear relationship means constant, constant slope. That's what constant slope. And constant slope means it's a straight line. It's not a straight line. It's not a straight line. It's not a downward sloping straight line or, or upward sloping straight line. But rather, what we found is that, the relation that we found is that, it has a curvature to it. It has a curvature. Curvature means having curvature in mathematical use, but it means in, mathematic, in mathematical term, when 
when there is a curvature is that the slope keeps changing at every point. At every point there is a new slope. The rate, the slope does not remain constant. It changes at every point. It's not a linear relationship. The relationship is not linear. But we crossed out A, we crossed out B, we crossed out D. I wonder what the answer is in fact. And C says, C says that X goes up, Y goes down. Which is, oh, X, X goes down, Y goes up. Which is a negative relationship, negative correlation, which is exactly what we see here. They are related, and the correlation is negative. As one goes up, the other one goes down. No need to say X or Y. As one goes up, the other goes down. And you can substitute X or Y in that if you like. As X goes up, Y goes down. Or you can say as Y goes up, X goes down. It's the same thing. They move in the opposite direction. The very last question of our program of the series of D6. There we go. It's, we need the room, so I'm going to erase all of this thing. It's a very simple, straightforward question. We're simply being asked to figure out the volume of a cylinder. And before we worry about what a cylinder is, what does volume mean? When we talk about volume of something, what does it mean? A volume measures the space inside something, how much stuff you can put in it. And the cylinder looks like this. Cylinder looks like this. This is your cylinder. How much stuff that I can stuff in this cylinder? How much stuff I can stuff this? We don't want to use the we don't want to use the word stuff as a noun and a verb. How much stuff I can put in that cylinder depends on two things. It depends on how wide open the opening is, how, how wide open it is, which depends on the area of this circle. And the area of the circle we know is pi r squared. And it also depends on how deep it is. How deep is the cylinder? Which is the height of the cylinder? And therefore, therefore the volume is simply equal to the area of the circular opening on the top, the area of the circular opening on the top, times the height. That's all. And the, and, 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 and the data is already given to us. We are told, let me change the color. I don't know why we keep changing the colors. Probably because we have the flare for the dramatics. We are told that this particular cylinder has a radius of two feet. Has a radius of two feet. This distance right here, from here to here, is two feet. Two feet. And the height we are told, well actually they do not tell you the radius is two feet. What they tell us is the diameter. What the problem tells us is that the diameter is four feet. The diameter is from here to here. If that's four feet, then the radius is half of that, which is two feet. And they also tell us that the height is 40 feet. So let's find out the volume. Change the color one more time. All we're going to do is substitute the values. So the volume is going to be pi times r squared. r is 2. Remember, r is 2. So it's going to be 2 squared times the edge, which we know is 40. What is the what is the what is the unit for area of the circle? Unit for area of the circle is you see it's two feet times two feet. It is this two there is actually two feet times two feet. So the so unit for the circle is going to be feet squared. This portion right here is going to be feet squared times 40 feet. Watch what happens. So when we when we keep track of the units, when we keep track of the unit. Here we have feet squared times feet. Feet squared times feet is going to be feet cubed. The unit is going to be feet cubed. All we have to do is figure out the numerical value. And in order for us to figure out the numerical value, we need to substitute the value for pi. We need to substitute the value for pi. And what is the value of pi? What is the value of pi? To which the answer is no one knows. No one in the planet knows. Because pi is an irrational number. What? Why? Because pi is an irrational number. 
When we say irrational number, it doesn't mean that number is not logical. That's not what irrational means. Irrational means irrational antinom of irrational is rational, but rational, when we talk about rational number in mathematics, we're not talking about logical numbers. Rational simply means it can be represented as a ratio of two numbers. As a ratio of look, seven. Seven is a rational number. Why is it a rational number? Because it can be represented as a ratio of two numbers. I can write seven as 14 over 2, I can write 7 as 7,000 over 1,000, I can write 7 as 70 over 10, I can write 7 as negative 21 over negative 3. Do you understand? There are infinite possibilities. If a quantity can be represented as a ratio of two numbers, it is called a rational number. The word rational comes from ratio. A rational number is something that cannot be represented as a ratio of two numbers. If you're interested in learning this topic properly, just type in rational numbers, Keshwani. Anytime you want to learn any particular math concept, just type in the name of the concept, whether it's area of a circle or area of a, uh, area of a rectangle or whatever it might be, or, or percentage or, or, or whatever it is that you might, you, might, you might want to learn your 10th or the 8th. Just type in the name of the concept and then after that type in Keshwani and something will pop up. Something will pop up. I have close to uh, almost 3,000 videos on my channel. There is something that is there that will cover that topic. Just type in irrational numbers, irrational numbers, and Keshwani and learn that. Watch that video. This topic of irrational number was also covered in the first edition, in, in the fifth edition rather, from day one to eighty. I just don't remember where it was. Anyway, enough of the very long talk. Pi is an irrational number. What is the value of pi? To which the answer is nobody knows. Nobody in the world knows because it never ends. If you pi write down the value of pi, it will never end. They say 3.1416 is a good approximation. 3.14 is a good approximation. To which our answer would be the bloody hell with that. We are going to use an approximation of 3. Let's just pretend. But we can no longer, we can no longer say volume is equal to. We, now we have to say volume is approximately equal to because we're going to substitute the value of pi as 3. We are, just say, we are claiming that pi is approximately 3. Is that, is that a legitimate claim? Is that a correct claim? The answer is yes, it is. It is a correct claim because we're not saying where pi is equal to 3. We're not making that claim. We're claiming pi is approximately equal to 3. Whether you say pi is approximately equal to 3.14 or whether you say the pi is approximately equal to 3.1416 or whether you claim that pi is approximately equal to 3, they are all perfectly legitimate claims. Put in 3 here. Don't waste your time. 3 times 4. 2 squared is 4 times 40. 3 times 4 is 12. 12 times 40. 12 times 4 is 48. 12 times 4 is 48. And then we have a 0 here. We have a 0 here. We put a 0 here. Our volume is 480. The question is 480 what? Hippos, monkeys or bananas? What is the unit here? The unit here is 480 feet cube. 480 feet cube. And this is the very last thing we're going to talk about before before we say goodbye to each other, which is this right here. I'm going to put it here. I'm going to rewrite here. The volume is equal to 480 feet cube. This is how it should be read. Feet cube. It should be read as feet cube. Just like you will read this as 4 cube. Just like you will read that as 7 cube. We will not read this as cubic 4. We will not read this as cubic 7, but for some strange and inexplicable reason, but for some strange and inexplicable reason, reason that can be explained, the, the norm, the tradition, the, the, the convention dictates that we read this as not feet cube. People do not read this as feet cube. They read this as, as cubic feet. Cubic feet. This is how it is read. Even though your, mathemat your mathematics professor will say this is wrong. It should not be read as cubic feet. It should be read as feet cube. We do not read this as cubic cubic 4. We do not read this as cubic 7. We read this as 7 cubed. 4 cubed. Feet cubed. Not cubic feet, but that's how we read it. So that's the answer. 480. Look at the answer choices. Find the one answer choice that comes closest to it. Because keep in mind we are using the value of pi as 3. So let's see what the answer choices are and pick the one that comes closest to it. Do you understand? 
very quick take a look at here. The first one says 251, it's not 251. The second one says 2009, it's not that. The third one says 160, it's not 160. 502.7, 502 is, is, very, is very close to 480. That's your answer, I forget the letter now. That was, that was letter D. That was it. It was a pleasure and an honor for me to work with you. I wish you all the best on the exam, on T's, and I wish you the very best in life and in your career, in a nursing career. If you want to work with me, as I told you in the beginning of the video, get hold of me by phone call 1-800-808-PREP or email address prepsat at AOL.com. I'll be more than happy to do what I can to help you get a better score. Good luck to you in life. Bye now. It was an honor.